Hello, and welcome to this episode of Burn Your Draft, the podcast exploring the Reed College thesis process and experience. I'm your producer, Albert Corellis, and today you'll be hearing host Amelie Andreas talk with Reed Class of 24 philosophy major Joseph Puglisi Clark about his thesis on the nature of assertion. Joseph can fill you in on the details. My name is Joseph Puglisi Clark. I was born in LA, but I'm, I consider myself from Phoenix, Arizona. I just graduated as a philosophy major, and the name of my thesis was, I went for a simple name, tried to, tried to just lay it out there and say, asserting as committing. It's simple, but also mysterious, because I feel like there's so many different ways that you could take those words and interpret them. Sure. I think you're really right to say that it's a little mysterious and that it could go in a lot of different ways, which was part of part of the intent. But I think really I meant it actually quite literally. Nice. The, the devil's always in the details. <laughs> and so figuring out what asserting is and what committing is, and then also what it means, what the as is going to be doing. Oh, I didn't even think of the as. <laughs> <laughs> those those are going to be where a lot of the, the legwork in the thesis comes out. But mm-hmm. really what I just mean to be saying is I'm essentially arguing that when we assert, we are committing. We make a certain kind of commitment. Could you give us an analogy or something? Like what's an everyday situation where the things that you're talking about your thesis might apply? Sure. Well, the beauty and one of the things that uh, that drew me to talking about assertion is that we assert all the time. Mm-hmm. That last sentence was an assertion. <laughs> this entire podcast is going to be very full of assertions. Uh, there's there's a, there's arguments that assertion is kind of the default speech act, that the the primal thing that mm-hmm. we do when we when we talk is make assertions. Mm-hmm. Any sentence, to use like a little bit of a some terminology, any sentence uttered in the declarative or indicative mood mm-hmm. is going to be an assertion. When you just, when you make any statement of fact. So basically everything is an example of asserting is committing. Them. Anything that doesn't have a question mark <laughs> or an exclamation mark at the end is probably going to be <laughs> an assertion. Uh, I give some criteria. specifics in the thesis about what, it, what, you know, it's not everything, but it's a lot. Mm-hmm. So any sort of uh, informative statement of that kind is going to be an assertion. So how did you get interested in this kind of work? Like both philosophy in general and specifically this field that feels, it feels a little bit linguistic. It, it's like definitely tied in your philosophy major. How did all of that come to be for you? Yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll say something about the thesis topic first, mm-hmm. which I was taking some classes with a uh, professor, Mark Hinchliffe, and we came up on offhandedly sort of mentioning this one area, this one topic in philosophy called Moore's paradox, mm-hmm. which basically this philosopher G more noticed that there's certain kinds of sentences that when you say them, it sounds wrong. It sounds like you're doing something wrong, Mm -hmm. but there's no real reason why that should be the case. So the the classic example is if I said to you, it's raining, but I don't believe that it's raining. What? (laughs) It feels so weird. Doesn't that sound really weird? Like that sounds like, (laughs) that sounds crazy. But then if you think about it many, many times in my life, has it, it's been raining, mm-hmm. but I didn't believe that it was raining. Mm-hmm. And you notice if I said to you, it was raining, but I didn't believe that it's raining. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Uh, if I said it was raining, but you didn't believe that it was raining, also fine. So it's only in the first person mm-hmm. present tense that this paradox, mm-hmm. that it sounds wrong. And so part of the puzzle of the paradox was to explain, well, why is that the case? And my thesis kind of gives an answer for that which is that it has to do with the nature of assertion. Mm. So you can, these sentences can be true. They go together perfectly fine. But when you say them, uh, something, something bad happens and something <laughs> sounds wrong. What was your process like for this thesis? Like, was it mostly thinking and, and contemplating or looking at a lot of resources, just practicing asserting by <laughs> yourself, you know? <laughs> I think for me, my process was 15% reading whatever my advisor gave me. And Paul was really helpful for, I would just Mm -hmm. talk to him about things and he would say, oh, that sounds like this article I read in 1978. Here, go read it. And I was like, wow, that's (laughs) that's a long memory. And then it was about 65% long walks. 
And I would just walk around and try to think mm-hmm. about things and say things to myself, assert to myself and uh, <laughs> see if it sounded wrong or not. Yeah, my Hume papers were a lot of long walks as well. At the end of our <laughs> at the end of the first year, our professor was like, what advice would you give to, to future Hume students? And my advice was take your paper with you for a walk. It'll never turn out badly. I, I endorse that 100%. I am a little bit of a strange person in terms of work times. I do my best work after midnight. In fact, I really struggle to start working on things before like 11.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having Monday morning thesis meetings, which meant that in in line with my nature as a procrastinator, I did a lot of thesis work on Sundays. Uh, I also happened to be on Reed's soccer team, and we had games on Sundays. So my average thesis week looked like doing some light reading all week until Sunday when I would go play soccer for two hours. Then we'd go out to the bar afterwards, you know, have some, uh, some libations, <laughs> drink a couple pints. Then I'd get uh, home. Important part of any philosophy. Thesis. <laughs> then I would uh, get home at like 2 a.m. and work until my thesis meeting at oh, 11. Oh God, that is a heinous schedule, Joseph. That is heinous. It was actually so fun. <laughs> and I loved every second of it, but my roommates and friends all thought I was insane for the, the weekly all nighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On Sunday but night, I, I nonetheless, that's a, that's a brave night. Going back, I wouldn't have changed it. I think that that, that worked for me, but uh, that's certainly an interesting, that's my most interesting thing for my thesis was the soccer bar thesis work every, every <laughs> week. Yeah. I'll have to recommend that model to anyone who's having a struggle with productivity during daylight hours. <laughs> I think everyone should work on their thesis in exactly that way. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thesis working model from now on. What kind of skills do you think you ended up acquiring or strengthening during this experience? I think the biggest thing after I've done a little bit of reflection on this recently, because I've been uh, doing some job hunting Mm -hmm. and the number one thing that I think this is really like they say, they always tell you it's a different animal than writing like a final paper for a class, Mm -hmm. but it really is just a completely different thing in order to write 70 pages of scholarly work on a topic you kind of can't go into it half cocked. I mean, people do, Mm -hmm. but those theses uh, often turn out a little uh, little suspicious. (laughs) So I think that the number one skill that I learned was, was twofold. One, to absorb an enormous amount of information and then try to have a new thought. Mm -hmm. It was often very paralyzing to Mm -hmm. read like long lineages of scholarly work. And then just me, Joseph in my room at Reed College is trying to say something that hasn't been said before by Mm -hmm. thousands of professors. (laughs) And then the other one was kind of going after that to really take some, take some thread to its full conclusion. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when I was writing other papers for other classes, you just need to have an idea and then you Mm -hmm. type it up and send it off and it's good. But with thesis, there really is like, you need to put a bow on it. You need Mm -hmm. to wrap it all the way up and have your idea and then trace it all the way down through every iteration and try and uh, try and hunt down all the entailments and stuff. Yeah, it really is just like an ultimate act of synthesis. And that is something that is applicable in so many different contexts. So, yeah, I think it'll definitely lend a hand with the job hunting. I think so. (laughs) You've got the little elevator pitch down. (laughs) What kind of unexpected challenges did you deal with while you were working on your thesis? I think I underestimated how hard it was going to be to figure out what I was going to be thesising on. Mm -hmm. My roommate is a spring fall senior. And so he's Mm -hmm. just had his first semester of thesis. And the whole time as I was finishing mine, I was telling him, you you know, the classic Mm -hmm. experience is to do all of the work second semester. (laughs) I was trying to tell him, please do all of the work first semester. Like you will love yourself the more topic selection that you do. It was really, really hard to find a topic 
that mm -hmm. was not only interesting at first glance, but also would be interesting at the full end of the year mm -hmm. and that you could also say something about. So those mm -hmm. two things together, interesting and like tractable were, were, it was hard to find. I don't I actually don't know if I succeeded, but. Yeah, it's an elusive combination. Absolutely. So what ended up being the outcome of your work with this project? Either that can be a personal outcome or some kind of conclusion that you had that was especially salient. Yeah, I think I, I wrote this in the in the preface of my thesis that I really set out. There's a, there's a couple kinds of theses. Some of them are really personal and somebody has a, a really personal mm -hmm. question that they want to answer and they want to spend a year doing academic work to answer that question. And I think that can be really fruitful. And then some of them are, I need to write a thesis for graduation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to find something that's interesting and then work on it in sort of this dispassionate way. Mm -hmm. And I really definitely went in for the latter. I wanted to write something that would be interesting and I wouldn't hate working on it. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that I have enough like perfectionism in me that if this was something where I really cared about it in a deep personal way, mm -hmm. I would just never be able to write anything that I was happy with. Mm -hmm. So the outcome was the outcome that I wanted, which was I was going to write something that mm -hmm. was a work of academic philosophy that I ended up thinking was good and that I was hoping was going to be good, but it is no more and no less than that. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe some, some wisdom that I unknowingly anticipated was to not, not try to do too much and also not try to do too little. Mm -hmm. I think people forget that the end of your undergraduate career is definitely not the end of like your life as an academic or a person or a thinker or any of those manifold things. Like the thesis is definitely not the be all end all of, you know, what you're going to be putting into the world. Yeah, there's there's a lot of talk about the the capstone. The thesis is the capstone. And I mm -hmm. sort of don't see it that way for for at least my work. Uh, it's something mm -hmm. that I poured a lot of time into and that I ended up being happy with, but it's definitely not a culmination of who I am as a person or what I can do as a thinker. The plan in the next couple of years is to end up going to law school. Mm -hmm. I was pretty deeply involved in Reed's mock trial team and sort of the Reed legal network and eventually want to end up practicing law, which is part of why I became a philosophy major mm -hmm. in the first place. I think there's a lot of carry over there in terms of like the analytical thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the plan for the next couple of years. It was too much to try to do law school applications and write a thesis at the same time. I knew that one would suffer in quality. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to take, take a gap year and make sure that both of them were of, of high quality. Looking longer than that, who knows? I think it's hard to... I like to have a plan for the near future mm -hmm. and then the far future will... If you're always planning for the near future, you know, you're just going to gonna be able to keep going. So that's, yeah. that's my plan. You never plan. run out of near future. That's right. <laughs> Tomorrow never comes. If you've got a plan for tomorrow, you've got a plan mm -hmm. for every day of the rest of your life. <laughs> I like that. That's so quotable. I feel like that could definitely be like one of those quotes with like mountains in the background. <laughs> I like it. Or a bad tattoo somewhere. Yeah. Oh God. Hopefully not a bad tattoo. Do you have any advice for people who maybe are, are starting out their thesis or starting out their read experience as a whole? I think the advice that I would give to those two people would be wildly different. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is starting their read experience, I would tell them to just like take as many different classes with as many mm. different professors as possible. Read is a much better place when you find what you really like instead of trying to force yourself to do something that you think mm -hmm. you should be doing. For the burgeoning thesis student, I would tell you that the trap is you already know what the trap is. Mm -hmm. The trap is to say, oh, I'm going to do that <laughs> in the future. You know, every, every reading who's ever come and gone from this place has said 
oh, I'm going to get work done over winter break on my thesis. (laughs) No one has ever written stuff on their thesis over winter break. So it's like, it's so easy to try and offload Mm -hmm. work onto your future self. And yeah, just don't, I mean, it's, just, do it. it's about being compassionate for, for future you. Cause yeah. you know, I don't think anybody should be working on their thesis in winter break. That's just silly. It's called a break for a reason. <laughs> but no, I agree. That is some, some good advice for, for all of our listeners who are looking down the barrel of senior year. We're just getting started. Well, that is all the questions that I have for you today, Joseph. Thank you so much for coming on our little podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for getting on the pod, Joseph. Your Sunday all-nighter strategy for thesis work is certainly an interesting one. Maybe I'll try it next time I have to edit a podcast in a crunch. I hope you'll join us again to hear more from students and alumni about what it means to burn your draft. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, check out our Twitter and Facebook pages, and rate us on Apple Podcasts. Burn Your Draft is a production of Reed College and the Center for Life Beyond Reed, created jointly by students, alumni, and staff. This episode was produced and engineered by me, Reed College student Albert Corellis. Your lovely host today was Reed student Amelie Andreas. Our executive producer is Seth Paskin, class of 1990, with technical advising from Joe Janiga. Our project manager is Nate Martin, staff member in class of 2016. Music by Jack Salvucci, class of 2020, and podcast art by alumni Henry Gotchlik and Lillian Pham. This podcast was made possible by a gift from Seth Paskin.